Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm still inflicted a little bit with the plague, so I'm going to let these guys do most of the talking, but I'll be moderating throughout. Um, so for those of you who are repeat attenders at our plenaries, you know that the issue of licensing has been on our radar for a very long time, and we've had significant discussions about it in the past, and we've made submissions on the previous proposals for LPP, and then to do away with the LPP, and then the dialogue on licensing that came out of that. Um, and so when the dialogue on licensing was announced, as Diana already mentioned, there was a little bit of a road show that went and had uh, sessions in Hamilton, London, Ottawa, Thunder Bay, Windsor, Toronto, and Sudbury. Um, I attended the ones in Sudbury, so lovely remoteness and law society not recognizing what that means. I would drive, go to work all day, drive three hours to be in Sudbury for six o'clock, do a two hour meeting and then drive back and go to work the next day. And they said, isn't it great that we're coming and consulting with you? I was like, yeah, thanks. You had a direct flight from downtown Toronto to Sudbury, but all right, it was nice. Out of that and my bitching and moaning and complaining and gesticulating wildly, I got recruited for the LPP <laughs> mentorship program, which makes me wonder what they're looking for in their mentors. Someone who just complains about the Law Society or not, I don't know, but anyway. Um, so there were four topics. The need for change, market dynamics in the lawyer profession, licensing examinations, assessment of entry level competence, which was a webcast out of Toronto, which turned into an in-person session in Toronto that you had to somehow, I don't know how people got invited to that, but you turned on the webcast and there were 50 people in the room who got to be there. I don't know why, anyway. And transitional training. And out of that, uh, they, then they, all of these have summary reports which are available on their website. Diana didn't get you, give you what that website is, so if anybody doesn't know, it's www.lsucdialogue.ca, LSUC Dialogue. They're going to have to change the name of the website too, I guess. And um, they asked for submissions. We provided submissions. All kinds of organizations did as well. And the hope is that that is now going to turn into early 2018, some more concrete submissions. So the view that FOLA took at that time, we uh, came to the table. I was the most recently called. So that seemed to be the person who made sense to take the path on this. And at that point, we wanted to do a very high level submission because in, on a a topic like this, there was no way we were going to get a consensus from 12,000 lawyers. That's just not going to happen. But we felt that we could make some sort of agreement on what we hoped to come out of this process, which was that whatever the pressure is on the flood of graduates from law school coming in wanting to be licensed, that that doesn't result in a diminution of the high standards for our profession. We work very hard, we're very educated, and we're very competent, and that should not be reduced by any shape or fashion. And so our pull quote from our report is that we maintain that the, the efforts should be made to remove any barriers to, that might prevent or disadvantage certain segments of the population. But these efforts to remove barriers cannot diminish the high standards demanded of access to the profession. Standards of competence and integrity must remain the impetus behind the design and implementation of the licensing system, as it's only well-educated, well-trained, and well-prepared lawyers that serve the interest of the public. We can't get rid of transitional training. We have to have very challenging bar exams, and we have to have strong ethical components of our licensing system, whatever it ends up being. So now we turn to the less high level, and we're moving towards specific. So the CCLA approached us and asked, could they bring their proposal that they had made to the dialogue on licensing submissions and bring it to everybody else as, as a starting point for a conversation about how do we move from those high level discussions into having very specific input into the design of this system? How do we make sure that our voices get heard? Because we're very good at critiquing things, but we want to make sure that we give input on how this program gets designed. And we want to be ready for when they are, bring out their interim report in January, February, March, whenever that early 18, 2018 is, that we can respond to that. So Jill Alexander is going to give a, a summary of the CCLA's proposal that they made to the Law Society. And this is not a suggestion that we adopt this proposal, but we want it to, since they did make a specific one, this is a possibility. What are other possibilities? What are these specific things we want the licensing process to include? And that's the sort of dialogue that we want to have. LPP is here to present on what they are currently doing, what's working, what isn't, could this be done province-wide or not, 
And uh, yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Jill. Thanks very much, Bridget. And um, thanks very much to FOLA's executive for putting this item on our agenda for plenary. Um, licensing is such an important topic to our profession. And I would suggest that our interests are, in fact, exactly the same as the law societies on this particular issue. Uh, we all want a licensing system that is fair and that is sustainable and that provides the public and the profession with some level of confident, confidence that the newest members of our profession are competent. So I'm only going to take about 10 minutes to share with you how the CCLA participated in the dialogue on licensing, uh, to share with you the feedback that we got from our members and the proposal that we came up with. Uh, and I want to run through this fairly quickly because I, I'm really keen to have input from others uh, with respect to the issues um, that we're talking about today. So let me talk first about uh, our approach, how we how we dealt with the dialogue on licensing. Uh, the CCLA put together a working group of 12 very enthusiastic lawyers from our association, uh, which was chaired by a CCLA trustee by the name of Roslyn Conway. Our working group was very diverse. It included junior and senior lawyers, lawyers from big firms, lawyers from small firms. We had representation from different practice areas, including criminal, civil, family, real estate, we had a professor, we had a student, so we felt that we had a good um, uh, group of diverse people to comment and work on this project with us. The working group participated in the dialogue sessions that were organized in Ottawa in April, May and June, uh, and I attended a couple of those as well. They also carefully reviewed the reference materials that the Law Society put together uh, for the dialogue on licensing. And I have to say, those materials were outstanding. They contained some really interesting and important statistics that we have to keep in mind as we're trying to create a solution uh, to some of the problems that we're seeing with our current licensing system. Uh, the working group also considered feedback from other members, we uh, asked our members to provide their, their feedback through uh, a request for input from our, uh, through our newsletter. And they also considered prior de debates that we've had. We've been talking about this issue for a decade now. Uh, we've put in many uh, submissions in the past with respect to the continuation of the LPP program, the articling crisis. So um, we examined the history of this dialogue going back a number of years. At the end of the day, um, we decided that our goal should be to try and find a solution. Uh, we've been talking for so long about the problems with our current licensing system, but we haven't really done much in the way of putting forward a concrete proposal. And so that's what we sought out to do. And now I want to share with you uh, some of the feedback that we got from our members with respect to each of the components of the current licensing system. So um, as you know, uh, all licensing candidates are required to pass uh, two licensing examinations, a barrister's and a solicitor's examination. Uh, they're seven hour examinations. And most of our members were in favor of retaining licensing examinations as one component uh, of the licensing process. But we did hear uh, complaints from candidates who expressed doubt that those licensing examinations are in fact uh, a good measure of competence. Uh, they said it felt like a an exercise in navigating your way through an index. They were um, handed a big group of materials with no guidance uh, in terms of how to deal with them. Um, and many Francophone uh, members in our community told us that they opted to write these examinations in English because they were easier to write in English and easier to pass in English, which is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, the more senior members of uh, our association were quite concerned to hear uh, the comments of our young lawyers about 
the licensing examinations. And in fact, many of our senior members started reminiscing about the old bar ad courses, which I'm sure uh, many of you participated in. Uh, you'll remember, for those of you who did the bar ads, uh, we were given the opportunity to work with lawyers in our community. We appreciated that mentorship. It made the learning a little bit more meaningful, and it made it um, a little easier to uh, uh, approach those examinations. So our members say keep licensing examinations, but maybe we need to evaluate those and make sure that they're achieving what we hope they are. With respect to articling, uh, as you know, that's the most common path to becoming licensed uh, here in Ontario. Uh, across the country, articling is required in every one of our provinces. Uh, the articling term varies a bit from province to province. Most provinces have 12-month articling terms. Uh, we have a 10-month articling term. BC has a 9-month articling term. Uh, and Quebec, uh, Quebec has a 6-month articling term. Again, all of our members, and I actually we didn't hear any opposition to maintaining articling as an important component of the licensing process. But we know that there's concern that the recruitment process does not result in merit-based hiring. There's concern that articling represents an unfair barrier to becoming licensed <coughs> for many. Articling doesn't always offer training that's relevant to the candidate's interests. And I think the most critical problem with articling is that it doesn't provide us with any comfort that people are getting consistent training across the province. So uh, our members really unanimously agreed that articling has to be a component of the licensing process, but we need to do something to correct all of these problems that we've been talking about for years. Feedback we received with respect to the LPP. Uh, you'll remember that the LPP was created in 2014 as an answer to the articling crisis. Um, currently, I think there are about 237 students taking the LPP program at Ryerson in, in Toronto. There's also a PPD program offered through the <coughs> University of Ottawa, uh, 12 students only in that program. Most all of our members were in favor of preserving the LPP, and I think the profession province-wide was in agreement with that. Uh, you may remember last year the Law Society threatened to end that project before the um, uh, pilot project was over. Uh, the profession spoke loud and clear on, on uh, their views on this. They felt that the program was an important one. It was an important alternative path to articling for those who couldn't uh, get articles. Uh, and in addition, there are many um, benefits that we're seeing from that program. But concerns were raised with respect to the stigma associated with those students who are choosing an alternative path to articles. There's a perception that these were the lesser students who couldn't get articling positions. We know that's not true, uh, but the stigma exists. And then, of course, there's the financial disadvantage faced by those who choose the LPP path. So now we have our members agreeing that articling should remain part of the licensing process. The LPP should certainly remain. Licensing examinations should remain. So we started thinking, how, how do we develop a solution that's going to eliminate the problems that we've identified with respect to each of the components of the um, licensing process, and at the same time preserves the good that we have in our current licensing process? So our proposal was that every licensing candidate should be required to complete the four-month education component of the LPP. So Gina and Andre are going to tell us a little bit more about the LPP for those of you who wish to learn more about it. Uh, but there's a four-month education component um, uh, as well as a four-month placement component. And I won't say more about that just now, but um, our association felt that all law students should benefit from the four-month education com component of the LPP. We then thought that the articling period should re be reduced from 10 months to six months in order to allow the students that four-month uh, educational training. 
And then we propose that every licensing candidate should continue to be required to complete the, the licensing examinations, provided that those examinations are evaluated to ensure that they are a valid and accurate measure of entry level competency. So the advantages of this solution, it virtually eliminates the stigma associated with the LPP because everybody's needing to take it now. It allows candidates to benefit from the state of the art experiential learning offered by the LPP and we're going to hear more about that from Gina and Andre. It preserves the benefits of articling which is also an experiential uh, training opportunity. And it at least opens the potential for the creation of many more articling positions. So just to put this all in context, uh, each year uh, we can expect about 2,400 uh, licensing candidates wanting to become uh, licensed to practice in the province of Ontario. 15, 1,600 of those are graduating from Ottawa law schools, about, or, sorry, Ontario law schools. Uh, about 300 are coming from law schools across the country. And there's another 600 plus coming from outside of Canada wanting to become licensed in Canada. Uh, so there's about 17 to 1900 articling positions created each year. Um, the articling positions uh, in the bigger centres, London, Hamilton, Ottawa, Toronto, they take up only about 400 of those articling positions. So most articling positions are offered by smaller firms. And we wonder if by release, uh, reducing the articling year from 10 months to six, that some of those smaller firms may double up on the number of articling positions they offer. They could offer two six month articling terms um, and, and this would help to alleviate the articling crisis. And our solution also uh, preserves the current licensing time frame uh, of 10 months. We thought that it was important students are coming out of law school, they're anxious to get called to the bar, they're not interested in taking a year and a half to get to the bar after they graduate from law school. So we came up with a solution that preserved the current 10 months or so uh, time frame that it takes students to get uh, licensed. And we think that this solution offers the profession and the public confidence that candidates are receiving a consistent level of training and education. So they're all going to get slightly different placements, slightly different articling experience, but we do know that they're all getting that four month LPP uh, and uh, that gives us some confidence that there's a consistency in training. So for the purpose of our discussions today, um, I would love to hear from all of you with respect to whether you think the licensing process should include these three components, licensing examinations, art, <coughs> articling and work placements, and the four-month education component of the LPP. Um, uh, we know that the Advocate Society has recommended abolishing articling. Um, if those of you are in favor of abolishing articling, I'd love to hear what you think the solution should look like. Should we simply let people write their licensing examinations and be admitted to the bar and we'll deal with competency afterwards. Uh, so I'm really hoping that our dialogue can be a sort of solution oriented uh, discussion. Uh, I know that there's a lot of concern with respect to uh, the number of law school graduates. It's something we hear all the time and it's a valid concern. Uh, but we also know the Law Society doesn't have much control over that particular issue. So although we talked about it, we heard from our members about it, uh, we tried not to let that sidetrack us in terms of coming up with a solution that might just work. So uh, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Gina, Gina and Andre. Um, uh, they're going to tell us a little bit about the LPP program for those of us who don't know a lot about it. And then we're going to open it up for dialogue. So thank you. Just like to mention if everybody isn't already aware, if you go to the FOLA website for the materials for today, you'll have the FOLA submission, CCLA submission, and uh, Ryerson has a presentation uploaded to that website as well. So if you need any more information, that's where it is. All right. I'm the shorter one here. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, first of all, uh, to the FOLA executive for inviting us to participate this morning so we can give you a little bit more information about the law practice program. Um, my name is Gina Alexanders, for those of you I may not know already, and I am the senior director at the law practice program at Ryerson. And I am here with Andre Bacchus, who is our assistant director of replacements from the law practice program as well. And the intention this morning from our perspective is to give you some additional information uh, to help you understand better what the law practice program is, perhaps understand what the law practice program is not, and give you some additional grounding as you engage in the debate that you want to have or the conversation that you want to, uh, to have. So as um, uh, you already heard, the law practice program that we are uh, responsible for is uh, run through Ryerson. There is a French-based program that is somewhat different. It's not a simulated um, online program, so it's somewhat different, and I'm not going to speak to that program, uh, but if you have any questions, our colleagues uh, at the University of Ottawa certainly are always open to, uh, to engaging in that conversation. Fundamentally, though, some of the core principles are, are the same. What I wanted to start off with in terms of the, the program and what it is and what it isn't, um, we've heard the word the alternative path to licensing. We've heard the word, uh, it's the other path to licensing. And I'm here to say it's the additional path to licensing. We really wanted to clarify that. I I'll put this point out there. We've talked about, we've heard the phrase, uh, the stigma. And if we keep talking about it, it's going to be there. And I think it's, it's time, because I see our colleagues, our future colleagues who are in the program, take great pride and great effort and have quite a lot of competency when they leave the program and I think it does an injustice to continue that conversation. So I'm putting that on the on the table um, right now on that part. So we're an additional path to licensing that candidates are actually selecting. So while in the beginning it may have been, okay, it's another option that I can take if I haven't found one option, it's now we're hearing more and more and Andre goes to the schools on a regular basis. Um, the first years, second years, third years of the, of the schools here in Canada are all kind of asking about it and at least exploring it as a possibility together with other uh, articling opportunities that they may have as well. And one of the, you've heard the, the comment, um, our task was to ensure that there is consistency and rigor in the training that they get. It's an eight month program, and I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview. It's an eight month program overall consisting of the training component for the first four months and then a work placement in the second four months. Um, we are Glad to answer questions about the uh, about the work placement. Andre will have um, a few moments to discuss with you some of the work placement uh, topics. But one of the things to keep in mind: they can't proceed to a work placement unless they've successfully completed the training component. It's a mandatory requirement of the overall eight-month program. They are meant to be part and parcel together, but you have to finish one before you finish the other. So what do we do? We were mandated by the Law Society. I'll say it publicly, Law Society of Ontario, first time I'm using LSO, but the Law Society of Ontario, um, to create a program that would be available to candidates across the province of Ontario. So even though Ryerson is the provider for the English <coughs> language law practice program, our mandate was that it has to be available to candidates from across the province, regardless where they are. And we do have candidates who are participating in the program from a number of jurisdictions across the province of Ontario and sometimes even uh, outside of the province for various personal reasons. And so it's a 17-week program from August to December. Jumping to the very bottom for a moment, the August, October and December, we thought it was important. Uh, relationships and networking and um, introduction to the profession was critical. And so we wanted to ensure that there was an opportunity, a mandatory opportunity, three times in those four months to come together as a group with their future colleagues, with mentors, with assessors, and be absolutely uh, in person with those, uh, with those groups. So for three weeks we have August, October, and December where they're in person at Ryerson. And I do know and thank uh, those of you who have joined us as assessors during those three weeks. In the meantime, what happens? And we're going to give you a little bit of a taste of what happens just so you can get a sense of what, uh, what the program is. What, what we have to do is ensure that the skills that we have been indicated, all of us, are required to ensure that our competency as a new lawyer uh, includes these, set, these, these uh, six skills areas. So ethics and professionalism, oral and written communications, analytical skills, 
research skills, and that's not just legal research, although that's a huge component, but also think about the interviewing of your clients and the due diligence that you're doing. That's all factual research, and we needed to ensure that that was a competency that is reviewed and uh, assessed. Client relationship management and practice management. So for all of us in, uh, in this room who are thinking about our day-to-day -day activities, our day-to-day -day lives, these competencies make sense. There are, of course, sub-factors for each of them, but overall, this is how you conduct your practice. This is what you're expecting of, uh, of colleagues to show a competency uh, as they approach the, the profession. 14 weeks had to be online for us, so we had to work with our colleagues at Ryerson uh, who uh, conduct the continuing education program to come up with a program that would be allowing people to join it from wherever they might be. And as I mentioned, the, the three weeks that are uh, in person are for the orientation, the foundational introduction, but then also October and December, in addition to some of the um, ongoing uh, presentations that they have, they have assessments. They are live in person and do assessments. Uh, those of you who join us in December know that typically we have real estate assessment or a civil and criminal assessment in the courthouses. And in October, we do various assessments depending on where the files are. So you're asking, you're, you're thinking possibly, what files is she referring to? So let me just go through what, um, how we conduct our program. From day one, in fact, before we even get to day one, we actually start our candidates uh, in, really we start introducing them to the program as early as July with some materials and some information uh, to get them thinking about the program, experiencing the program a little bit more so. It's work, not school. While it is administered by a university setting, the the ethos that we ask uh, of them from the get-go is that you are now, you've left school, you've graduated, congratulations. We're not here to teach the substantive law. We expect that you've already learned the substantive law and you know how to find substantive law. We have resources, which I'll share with you in a few minutes. Um, but the understanding is that we're now converting to work. So we um, situate our, our program as a virtual firm. The learning management system that we have at Ryerson has been reconfigured to uh, be a virtual platform, a virtual law firm. And we really um, try and ensure that they think of what they're doing as a simulation of an actual practice. So we tell them, you are candidates. You'll hear us using the word candidates, not students. Uh, Bridget is, uh, <laughs> you know, is invested in the, the candidate experience. Um, we uh, tell them, in essence, they are committed to this from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then some, uh, Monday to Friday. We ask them to participate, especially when they have client meetings or mentor meetings. Um, in, uh, unless their supervisor allows them otherwise, uh, we expect professional attire. We want them to get into that ethos. So even if they're in their basement office or in the TIMS, they are conducting themselves as part of a virtual firm. And the, the tools that we use to, um, to develop the skills that I mentioned in the previous slide are the files that we have gotten, create, that we have developed from the profession, uh, subject matter experts across the province have put together files that we start rolling out from day one throughout the 17 weeks. And the subject areas that we have there are the subject areas that the Law Society has requested and required of us to provide to our candidates. So their experience from beginning to end, uh, the typical stages of these practice areas. Um, we are probably the only court, uh, when we get to the December court, where things has ha already happened in four months. Nowhere else in the province of Ontario can you go from a client meeting to a statement of claim to a, an actual <clears throat> quote-unquote trial in four months. But we wanted them to experience the various stages of the, uh, of the proceedings so that they have that experience. One of the things that's critical for us is the cycle for training. The, um, uh, perspective that we have introduced for training has been the following. You provide them with the tools to be able to experience um, a skill, an activity. You then have them experience that activity. You get feedback. At the initial stages, it's just feedback. At a later stage, it's assessment. 
You get them to reflect on what they've done, and they come back and do it again so they can practice. It's a safe, simulated experience for them to be able to develop the skills. And the confidence level that we hear that has built from, from August 20th to December, uh, before they move into a practice situation in the work placement, is, uh, is incredible from the feedback that we've gotten. What I do want to indicate is how we operate. So out of the 230-odd uh, candidates that we have in our program, we divide them up into groups of about four sometimes five, sometimes three, depending on the, uh, the randomness of the selection, and they create their firm. So we have about 60 firms every year that are operating together. So think about your experiences in the past and think about your current experiences. In law, we do a lot of things together as groups or working with colleagues, but we really don't get that training necessarily beforehand. Think about the committees that you've been on, uh, think about the uh, other activities in your offices, and so we needed right from the get-go to ensure that they were put into a group setting, a firm setting, and start thinking about themselves that way. Most of the times it works really well. Over the past four years, we've probably had a couple of those firms each year that uh, we go through mergers and uh, some changes to the firms because group dynamics can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge. Um, but we get them to first try and work through the challenges because you don't always get to choose the people that you're working with. And then in various circumstances, very limited, we may make some adjustments to the firm setting. Very important part of the, uh, of the firm dynamic is the mentor, a member of the profession who meets with them at least once a week on a, uh, on a virtual basis. So they get to see little boxes on, the, on their computer with their faces, gets to hear them, and engages with them uh, on two parts. We, we have a weekly agenda. The first part of the agenda is to talk about the various files that they're working on. So what's happening in the uh, family file? What are the questions that you might have? about the real estate file that you're working on. And the second part of the uh, agenda, because if you remember, one of the mandatory uh, competencies is ethics and professionalism, as well as client and practice management. So each week we set a theme that they have to read some materials on. And as an agenda comes around, there are materials that they have to review. And they are discussing in the second half of their meeting various components. So this, this week we are on the topic of wellness, if I'm not mistaken. Um, competency is, a, is another theme. Um, the business of law is another theme. The oath, we always start off with our oath uh, in week one and what it means to, uh, what professionalism and ethics mean in our profession. And these are conversations that uh, mentors engage in. Mentors are I really do enjoy, it's a lot of work, and, and uh, Bridget can probably attest to it, because what you're doing is preparing for that meeting with your firm of four, but you're also then reviewing their work, offering them feedback, and having to assess them at, at later stages as well. It's a huge commitment, and we appreciate it, but oftentimes we see the mentor saying to us, it really is beneficial for me to see the questions that they have and to help guide um, the future colleagues uh, in the profession. And we have clients, so you're asking how are clients involved. Uh, I always get a little bit of a jump in my step when I talk about the Interpersonal Skills Teaching Center at Ryers and the ISTC. Uh, fabulous program. Does anybody here have any affiliation with the medical profession or social work profession? Is there any folks here? Just a couple. Okay. So um, what happens in those professions as you uh, go through your training? At some point, there is an assessment where you have a client, uh, sorry, a, a patient uh, who is an actor. And this was happening in some of the sciences and the social science uh, professions, but it wasn't happening in law. And so Ryerson has developed a program where interpersonal skills te uh, uh, programming is taught to people via simulators, actors. And so we have clients in four of our files that are the clients for those files from the beginning to the end. So there's an intro, initial introduction, there are follow-up meetings, there are instructions that come from the candidate, from the clients, uh, there are tears, there are, there is anger, there's forgetfulness, just like your clients uh, in, your, uh, in your practices, our clients to give that experience to the candidates. And so that structure is critical for them to develop the skills. Um, I'm going to walk you through the experience in a moment, but I do want to add some additional things. If that's not busy enough for the candidates, we thought it important to add a couple of extra components. 
The firm has to prepare a business plan. We thought it was absolutely critical for them to understand the business of law and to think through the elements of a, um, a business plan for their firm. So from start to finish, they do have to think about, create um, a plan that if they wanted to, and we know that some of our candidates have in fact done so, when they've left, they really sort of pull off the cover sheet that says LPP, uh, fine tune it for their own specific needs. And we have had a couple of candidates who say to us, I've gone to the bank and talked to them about my future um, with that business plan. We ask them as a firm to work on an access to justice innovation challenge. So they're thinking about something that's happening in the law and creating um, new programs, services, platforms, apps that will help address the, an A to J uh, component. And this year we're taking it international and including a global component to it. In addition, during the in-person weeks, we uh, have three days of trial advocacy. So some of you have already participated in our trial advocacy program, where it's three very intense days with members of the profession um, Sheila Block, Jim Seconder, and about 50 plus lawyers come out for the full day of uh, trial advocacy training for our candidates, one in each of those three days. Um, in addition, because a number of our placements are in, from in-house counsel, we introduced last year uh, an intensive component of in-house counsel work so that they're thinking about the challenges and the issues and the opportunities that come to, in to corporate counsel. So they're working on scenarios right now that are typical of, uh, of, uh, of in-house counsel and working them through with their firm and then with their mentor as well. And we have a panel later on today who will take them through those scenarios. Um, as well, the, the e-discovery uh, group here in Ontario came to us a couple of years back and said, you know, it, it, it's something that we want to help introduce more and more new lawyers to. So they now have also incorporated a, a component. There's a case that they're working on on e-discovery. They just finished negotiating one firm with another, their e-discovery plans, and have just filed it, I think it was last week. So there are, they're busy. They're active and they are learning. What we wanted to do was just take you for a moment, um, once I introduce the technology partners, it's because it's simulated, we've had to work with technology partners who have really benefited our candidates um, to see what the opportunities are for them. So they, they dock at their time in Clio. Any Clio users here by any chance? Yeah, there's a few of you. So Clio is a practice management tool, cloud-based. They're wonderful partners. They are able to dock at their time on Clio, create um, draft uh, accounts for their mentors to look at in some of their files. They, they've gone on, they use Terranet for their searches. They just had that happen last Friday. They did their real property search and they got to use the new learning platform, the training platform in Terranet. So um, from what I've heard, it's really quite intuitive and I think we're all going to enjoy using it for those real estate lawyers out there. Um, they use the legal research services that you see uh, and uh, a number of other opportunities and Google Apps to help them coordinate their files amongst themselves. We have candidates who are, you know, one's in Toronto, the other's in Ottawa, the other's in North Bay, the other might be out in, uh, uh, in London, and then a mentor who might very well be in Ottawa as well. So we needed to be able to have the opportunity for them to all dialogue as, uh, as well as possible. So how does this all begin? Um, as I mentioned, we have the different files, and in each of the files in our office system, we have for them uh, a series of uh, resources that introduces the file. So they get to have an introductory email that gets pushed out to them, just like you get your emails, uh, and we intentionally don't send them out at you know 9 o'clock a.m. or 3 o'clock p.m. It's done at whatever time somebody might press send. So you know 9.17 a.m., uh, 2.43 p.m. and yes sometimes even late in the evenings and they get the emails pushed out to them to introduce a file so the introduction such as this one in a criminal file will be something along the lines of you know I've got a client coming in I want you to take the meeting next week um, I need you to ensure that you meet with me by video so they'll visit a video and have a conversation a pre-recorded video by the subject matter expert who, who outlines the steps very much like you would have somebody in your office talking to them about what to expect when they meet the client next week and where to get additional resources. That's how we introduce the files. Uh, and so the email will outline the various things that they're to do, the resources they're to look at, deadlines. Remember that one skill of practice management? They have deadlines coming, they've got a lot of deadlines uh, coming to them. They have about a hundred plus assignments over the four months. Anything from you know doing a, a client meeting to uh, responding to a client to crafting a letter to the client to drafting a pleading. 
all of those assignments in the matter of four months have to be done, um, you know, and if they don't do it on time, they have to account for it to, uh, to our coordinator. So they get the introductory email. And then we move to um, the file moves along, things are happening. We're going to play for you a, uh, a criminal, uh, the, something from the criminal file that they actually got at 8 o'clock in the morning one morning. They didn't know it was coming. They received a notice that said, you have an urgent message. And before Andre plays it, I just want to verify to you what we have done. After the first year, when we left this message open for the full day, we realized that um, part of the practice management skill development is reminding people that uh, sometimes... Oh, look, hang on. It, it, it's Andy. Where are you? I, I tried calling you. I thought you said that you were always available and that you would be there for me. I, I, I can't believe this. I, I have been arrested and I'm at the... Yeah, Shop. Man, you've got to come and get me. There's no way that I can stay here. Stupid trumped up charges. You, you know, I, I think they arrested me for breaching my curfew order. All I did was call her. Give me a break. This is the only time I messed up. I'm, I'm going to lose my job if I don't get out. Just get down here right now. The cops are saying I'm not getting out. Please, man, hurry up. The cops are hitting me and telling me that uh, I need to tell them everything. Uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I just want this to end. Call me. So that's what a candidate is listening to at 8.01, 8.02 on a certain morning, or if they haven't gotten to it, if they don't click open on their message, we actually shut it down at about noon. The idea behind that philosophy is if you haven't responded to an urgent message fairly quickly, you've either lost the client or something's happened to the client. Um, another message that we've played for them is a person, um, an elderly uh, client who is calling about a, uh, a bill that she just received. And she's an elderly woman, different language, and uh, is having a tough time. And the, the candidates by that one um, tend to report, or tend to respond a little sooner. They realize now that urgent means urgent and how do we address it. And it's a learning opportunity for them. If they haven't responded by noon to the Andy call, we then ask them for an explanation as to why they didn't get to it uh, within the four-hour time. And it's fine to do that during the training because it builds that, that understanding that in a professional services um, office, you really do need to be attuned to what the client and the customer is, is requesting. So as the file moves forward, um, this is just one example in our criminal file where we have a client and Andy does belong to all of our candidates. This year we've split them up because we wanted to give half the group a dimension of the, uh, uh, the Crown perspective. So they would have gotten a call from the, uh, the witness or the complainant and that they'd have to address on a very quick basis. So our firms don't always get the same information. Some will get the, the husband's information, some will get the wife's information in the family file, et cetera. Um, so as the criminal file works its way through, when we talk about the, the meetings, the candidates will have to interview the client initially and then we'll also have to follow up for additional meetings. So what we wanted to do was, this is a demonstration. Yes, you're seeing me. I'm not taking the program. Andy. Uh, uh, oh, here we go. Hang on. Just give me a second. Thanks for... So by, by WebEx, there are four people together who will be interviewing the client. You'll see Andy as well, one of our Andys, one of our simulators. And this is sort of a typical follow-up meeting that candidates will have with, uh, with their client. Andre? for calling in to us. Uh, I'm here with the rest of the firm. Uh, we want to just take a few minutes and go over um, any concerns that you have and go over what happened in the last little while. First of all, how are you? I know that the last little while, the experience in jail was a little bit of a, of a challenge, right? Yeah. It was, you know, not fun being in prison, so. But I'm glad to be out. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Now, I know that you... When you left the voicemail message, there were some concerns about what was happening in, uh, in jail. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that so that we can see if, we, if there's something that we need to do or we can do uh, with regards to that? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, like, you get to jail and so it's always a shock and, like, you know, they don't treat you good when you're there. Like, you get pushed around and stuff. So, um, I mean, even when they put me in my cell, I was kind of shocked that I was being put in a cell for, like, just leaving a phone message, so like you know, they they shove you when you go in, and even trip me once. So, you know, it's not right. Um, as you know, uh, Andy and I, I 
apologize for not starting off this way. I am taking notes so that if we need to go back, I, I have those notes uh, to, to rely on, okay? Because okay. um, you mentioned that you were pushed around, uh, and then you also said uh, because you called for a message. Do you want to just take a couple of seconds because you had a no-contact order, and I just want to make sure, we want to make sure that you understand what your obligations under that order uh, are because I think there, was some, there must have been some misunderstanding about that. Yeah, I know we, we we got through this. Like, it's just, I'm not supposed to like even leave a message. Is what right. I'm down to. But like, I mean, I, I didn't quite know that when I did, and I thought because I knew she wasn't going to be home or anything that it was okay. But apparently not. But I mean, right. it's it's a lot when someone in jail just for leaving a phone message, right? So, not saying that I didn't do. So they have a client who's just been in jail and is now out and are giving him some feedback and, and advice. And they all are on the call at the same time. I just did it with one of us, um, but three or four of them are meeting with him. And what does it do? It's developing their communication skills. For some of them, they're uncomfortable, uh, as, as all of us may have been when we were first dealing with this very difficult, these very difficult situations. They're trying to develop those skills and competencies. Sometimes their mentor will be watching and then afterwards during the firm meeting can give them feedback. Other times the um, candidates will give each other feedback and after having this kind of practice, one of the assessments in October is an in-person firm meeting with a brand new client. So they're getting the chance to get that first meeting, get that first discomfort, uh, uncomfortable situation with a client sort of under their belt so that when it happens in the placements, when it happens in practice, they've got that exposure and experience uh, available to them. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Andre because once they finish the training component, they move on to their work placement. Great. Thanks, Gina. If you could click ahead for me, that would be great. Wonderful. So as Gina mentioned, the candidates have to successfully finish the training component before they move into the four-month uh, work placement. The idea behind that is that they've got now some fundamental skills to be able to build upon in moving into the placement to help to contribute to someone's practice. But at the same time, uh, they're now going to be exposed to someone else's way of doing things and have to sort of learn from that and also build on the skills that they've gained. We've been very fortunate over the last three years to have close to 670 brand new positions created within the marketplace to allow for our placements. So we've had a 100% placement rate over the last three years with all of our candidates uh, in the various areas. Gina mentioned that one of our big placement areas happens to be the in-house legal teams. 30% um, of our placements are with large organizations who have an in-house legal department who typically wouldn't take an articling student on board because they really couldn't dedicate 10 months to that person or in some situations, didn't have the time to train them or really provide them all of the things that they thought they should be exposed to. But now, because of the training component has exposed them to 110 different tasks over four months, they feel comfortable bringing them on board and giving them the ability to get exposed to the work that they're doing in their practice. And we found out some great feedback from these in-house legal departments. In fact, some of them have turned around and hired their candidate full-time afterward because now they've got an indispensable member of the team who can help to contribute, and then all of a sudden, uh, they're realizing that when this person leaves, there might be a gap now in what they're able to accomplish. So new jobs have been created out of it. In addition to though the in-house legal teams, we also have a number of placements, as Bridget mentioned earlier, with small and sole practices across the province. Um, and that's wonderful to see, much more so in some cases than in the traditional route. And a number of the employers have mentioned to us that what they've experienced is that they couldn't commit to 10 months, but they could commit to four. And in fact, in four, they could figure out if this person was really uh, someone they'd like to include in their practice in the future, or at least be able to contribute to the development of the profession. And that was wonderful to see. So they're now participating in, in the process. In addition to that, we also have placements with legal clinics across the province, a number of whom have taken candidates on board. And as a result of their placement, wherever they had a need to be able to build something else, they were able to then draw from that pool of talent and open up either new opportunities or help add them to their existing team. And then finally, we have all three levels of government participating as well. And in fact, some of the departments in, in government, whether it's at the provincial, federal, or municipal level, have added uh, members to their team on a full-time basis from the program as well. One of the constant refrains that we get each year as uh, we 
chat with our employers to gather feedback about their experiences has been the quality the candidates have been able to demonstrate when they arrive, the understanding of the business of law, as well as the fact that they're focused on the client. They appreciate that they're running a business, you've got to service your client, whether they're internal or external, and you've also got to be efficient in doing that. And they wouldn't have necessarily had that experience or opportunity in law school, but they have gained it over the 17 weeks of the training component, and they aren't able now to implement that when they are on site. Um, and as a result then, uh, some of them have been able to hand files to folks and have them run with it, work with it. And in fact, in some instances where they've had an ARCLING student, uh, have to make the decision, do I hire the ARCLING student or hire the LPP candidate back full time? And in some cases, the LPP candidate has been the one who's been offered the opportunity because they are able to hit the ground running. So we've been very fortunate over the last three years to see that experience. We're continuing on track this year with our current cohort to award the 100% placement mark again. And we're seeing employers come back each year. We're also seeing some employers come back in subsequent years to take a break because they've hired someone now full-time from our team. Their office is full. Maybe they can't add someone in the subsequent year, but they can come back two years later. So it's been wonderful to see the experience, to hear their feedback. And we gather it each year from our employers and our candidates to see what, you know, what the experience has been for them, what they'd like to see improved and added to the program. And in fact, the training component each year evolves as a result. Um, so that's what we've experienced so far. We've been very, very fortunate and our candidates have uh, really had a, a great experience. And it's a, because we now have, uh, we're into year four, one of the, the really rewarding parts for us, and, and Andre may not have mentioned this yet, is that uh, we actually now have people who are in the profession working with other employers uh, who have gone through the program, and they're convincing their employer, oh, let's, let's go back and uh, look at an LPP candidate. So our alumni base is now really out there in the profession and, and encouraging people to think about the L, the the additional opportunity uh, other than uh, what, uh, what they're knowing of. So thank you very much. Any questions? Or we can take questions if we need to. All right, so let, now we'd like to turn it over to you guys. If you have questions or comments about the LPP program, if you have ideas about specific concrete proposals about how, how, what you would like to see the future of licensing include and what you think needs to be there, what we should be thinking about and focusing on, this is the time we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear from you in the coming months, obviously, as well. So if you don't have something now, that's fine. But uh, we'll be running around with microphones. Anybody? <laughs> Yeah. Mike, I, don't, I don't really need a microphone. I'm really quite loud. Well, for <laughs> it to be, to for, be you know. for it to be recorded onto our video system, everybody needs to use the microphones. So I just um, I had a question with respect to the placement um, piece. I I've only been out two and a half years. I did articling with a legal clinic, um, but a number of my uh, peers and now colleagues did do the LLP program. And I'm just curious for that uh, placement, the four month work placement. Is that um, is that is the student, or, or rather the candidate, uh, provided with an honorarium or any kind of income support in that four-month period? I know the, the course itself is um, paid by the candidate, uh, but with respect to the work placement, is there any consistency across the board there for those sure. individuals? So I'll, I'll take the question in another way. First off, um, when it comes to the program, articling students and LPP candidates pay the same fee directly to the Law Society of Upper Canada. So they don't pay us anything at Ryerson. We're contracted to develop and deliver the program for the eight month window. Um, when it comes to the four month work placement, um, the over 70% of our placements are paid. Many of them paid at a variety of different rates. So whether it's $14 an hour, which is minimum wage, or $40 an hour. And in fact, if we have a candidate placed with government or with a large firm, they're being paid the same rate as other folks within that office. So whether it's fourteen fifty a week uh, in a large firm, or if it's uh, twelve eighty a week uh, with the government, they're being paid the same the same rate. Uh, we find that the folks who aren't able to provide a full payment like that, some can provide stipends, and others, uh, if they're not able to provide any payment at all, let's say, um, which can be the clinic environment sometimes because the budget isn't there those roles can turn into full-time opportunities later on down the road and have done so in the past. Um, so it's not that the unpaid role is, is a complete uh, just four months of, of nothing. Sometimes it turns into a full-time paid role, whether it's with a small and sole practice or a clinic environment. 
follow up? Yeah. Can you just elaborate? The first part of what you said is there's no additional payment for the LLP. Right, for the LPP. So basically, there's no fee that the candidate pays directly to Ryerson at all. All licensing candidates pay the same fee directly to the Law Society of Upper Canada. And I think that is a dialogue we would have to have. I mean, cost is obviously an issue if we were going to roll this out to all law school graduates. My understanding is that each licensing candidate pays about $4,700 to the Law Society. I don't know what portion of that is allocated to the LPP program, um, but some portion of it is. Um, it, it's probably natural uh, for anybody who's been educated and trained in a certain way to think that's the best way to do it. So I still think the province made a mistake by getting rid of grade 13. <laughs> and, uh, here, here. I article for 12 years, or 12, it felt like 12 years. I was a slow learner. Uh, I article for 12 months. I did a six month bar admission course, and then I thought that was the best. Um, but I know that the province is not going to bring back grade 13, and I know that the Law Society is not going to bring back 12 months of articles and six months of bar admission. So, Jill, when I read the CCLA paper, I, I was really intrigued by it. I thought, it's an, it's an interesting blend. It's basically a, a shortened period of six months, you call it a practicum, but basically six months of articling followed by a four month standardized training, if I can call it that. And you didn't say it, but the program that they were proposing would flip those two time frames around. So some students would do the four month first, some would do the six month of practicum and, and then vice versa, so that the, it would be a circle through the year. Um, which I thought was, again, a very interesting idea. But with these things, obviously, the, the devil's always in the details. And the first thing that, that struck me as well, we know there's not enough articling placements now. Um, what makes us think that there, if it's six months, that's going to be a solution? And then I started thinking, and this isn't a question, I'm just throwing it out. But when Diana was um, giving her, her talk, um, she said that there are, there's going to be a, uh, a mandatory program for firms of 10 or more lawyers where they have to have equity and diversity policies, etc. And I started to think, well, if they're going to mandate that, that type of thing for a firm of, of a certain size, I think that the profession, I think lawyers owe the profession to train students. I think it's too hard, it's a financial burden for souls and smalls, but I don't see any reason why firms of a certain size can't take on a student. So again, I'm just throwing this out, what's wrong with going to the law <coughs> society and saying, look at the demographics of the firm, figure out how many students you have to place, and come up with a similar type of rule. That is to say, if you are a firm of a certain size, you must take, you must offer an article placement. Say, and use the same 10, 10, 10 lawyer firm. So a lawyer of, for every 10 lawyers you have, you must offer one article placement. If you're a lawyer of 11, 11 lawyers, uh, you have to have one. 22 lawyers, two. 32 lawyers, three. You must offer it. The second thing is the cost. At dinner last night, somebody mentioned at our table that there was a firm in Toronto that pays their articling students $100,000, which I think is nuts. <laughs> um, and the cost can be a burden. So can the law society, is there any reason we can't go to the law society and say regulate the compensation that's being offered to, to students? It cannot be more than X and it cannot be more than or less than Y. So if you're a firm of 11 uh, lawyers, you must offer an articling placement and you cannot pay them more than $60,000, you cannot play, pay them less than $30,000. And I'm wondering whether that would be, because when I read your paper, the first thing I said, I'm not sure if there's enough, if there are enough placements, but if you, if you can regulate it, and you can create those placements, and you can make them financially affordable, then it may be, uh, it may be a way forward. So a couple of comments on that. I, I think those are excellent ideas and ones we should be thinking about. 
in large part, the creation of the LPP did fill that gap that needed to be filled in terms of placements. Um, I think we still need to work on articling placements. I agree wholeheartedly that we can't be certain that by reducing the article year from 10 months to six months is going to result in double the positions. I'm, you know, for example, the Bay Street law firms, if, if the articling term is reduced to six months, I think it would be naive to think, well, we'll just hire double the students, even though we know they're all qualified and they might be happy to take double the students. Uh, but I do think that probably a couple hundred extra placements would be created by reducing that articling year by four months, because I do think it might be a more realistic time frame to take on a student for some of the smaller firms. But just on your comment, I'd be really interested, does everybody agree that some sort of experiential training by way of placement should continue to be a part of the licensing process? I, you know, I think that's a really, if, if we as a profession across the province can say to the Law Society, we absolutely feel um, certain that this needs to be a part of the licensing process. So that was going to be my next question, because I think the more radical proposal that we made was this idea of rolling out the LPP. And I appreciate there are cost concerns. Uh, there might be the concerns about how many mentors are willing to roll out this program to 2,000 students. Uh, and just by way of statistics, I understand there are about 60 mentors currently working with the LPP program. So uh, if that's 60 mentors for 250 students, uh, if, we, if we raise the number of students to 2,000, I guess we need about eight times the number of mentors, but I'm pretty confident with 36,000 practicing lawyers across this province that we'll find enough people willing to provide that mentorship. Can I so second question, does everybody agree that maybe we should be looking at a rollout of the LPP to all of our law school graduates, or are we too early to be asking that question? There's a few more comments sure. in the room if you want to go ahead. My question. <laughs> is somewhat in line with this. It, it's a, concerning the CCLA's proposal and your now proposal to potentially roll out the LPP to everybody. I've been a lawyer for about a year and a half. The licensing process is still very fresh in my mind. <laughs> and as you pointed out, uh, the fees as they stand now for someone going into the articling stream, north of $4,000. And in exchange for my $4,000, I got about 600 pages of materials that I had to print off myself um, and a seat at an examination table. And the LPP, sorry, the CCLA's proposal sounds wonderful for addressing a lot of the shortcomings that certainly exist in the process now. But this process with holes in it already costs over $4,000. And having come out of three years of law school where I was paying $24,000 a year, to now be confronted with the obligation to pay for, I mean, how much would this new process possibly cost? My concern is that the licensing process may itself become a financial barrier to entering into the profession. Uh, in my year, it almost doubled overnight, just in time for us to take the process. So my concern is that while it is in the good of the profession to have a very rigorous licensing process, will that process become so expensive that we discourage or even prohibit people from getting into it based on their level of financial means? Yeah, I, I agree. It's a, it's a very important discussion that we have to have. Um, and I think the first step is to decide what do we think the gold standard licensing process looks like? What do we think the components should be? And then we have to look at those costs. I, I would like to think that if we're rolling out a program that's now being rolled out to 250 students, that if you're rolling it out to 2,000, the cost per student has got to be coming down. Um, I don't think, though, that we can um, realistically think that it's not going to end up costing a little more. It, it is. Um, but if we end up producing competent lawyers and if we end up having a public and a profession that are feeling proud of what we've accomplished, uh, maybe that cost is worth it. But it, thank you for those comments. I, that's top of mind for sure for me uh, in terms of whether our proposal is viable. There's a comment back there yeah, in the center. <laughs> I 
Sure. I, uh, I, I share this gentleman's concerns about uh, the cost of becoming a licensee. Um, now, there is a third track towards becoming uh, a licensee in the province, and that's the integrated practice program that's being offered at the Boar Alaskan Faculty of Law at Lakehead. I'm acquainted with the program because I have two daughters who are there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, when I looked at their program, uh, I thought, this is the way law school should be. We don't expect doctors to go out and begin practicing medicine without having practical experience. Mm -hmm. And the medical schools, through their various programs, uh, offer that. Um, in, in the course of making submissions to the Law Society on the future of licensing, uh, where do the law schools stand on providing additional practical experience to the extent that at the end of your three years of law school, you've at least got some practical skills before you enter the licensing process. Yeah, thank you for raising that actually. The, the um, program in Thunder Bay at Lake Cal University is a very innovative program that essentially incorporates the LPP type of experiential training into the law school program. And we now know that Ryerson is also making a pitch uh, for a, another new law school with a similar sort of innovative approach to teaching. Um, and I think maybe uh, those two law schools are going to get the traditional law schools to stand up and take notice and maybe start having a dialogue with us and the profession about how they can help us uh, with the dilemmas we're facing regarding licensing. But so far, the law schools seem to be completely outside of this conversation, which is a bit of a head scratcher. They, they seem not to want to engage. Uh, they they certainly don't want to take responsibility for helping us out in terms of providing experiential training. But I think with these other law schools popping up, maybe they do want to come to the table. Maybe the LPP type program is reserved for the, the last semester of law school. It's, it's another interesting um, idea. So thank you for raising that. That's, a, that's an excellent program that they have. I think well, both, if I could just, what both of you last the two speakers have indicated is that both in terms of costs and in terms of training, there is a continuum that starts in, in on the first day of law school that leads to the day that you're called to the bar and then afterwards. And, you know, just to focus on the last 10 months or the last, you know, year uh, and sort of disregarding what happens three years before really is problematic. It really is a continuum. And then into CPD and, and continuous training and mentorship of our, of our colleagues uh, afterwards as well. I think we need to really step back and think about it overall. Yeah. Coming back. Hey guys, uh, Jeremy, don't forget they kept all of our materials <laughs> after the exam too. So all the like those two binders and the twelve hundred pages that we had, you remember we, we didn't get them back. No, no. Why why would they let us have that stuff, right? Um, I, I just want to say cut just a couple things uh, for for the two guests from Ryerson. Um, what I like is that a lot of people in this picture look like me. Uh, and I know our foreign trained, so I, I appreciate what the, the program is, is doing for people who look like me and are foreign trained. Um, but, but Joe, I was talking to Rick here real quick. Just in regards to uh, the, the CCLA proposal, which I think is very interesting, um, would you consider the bar portion to be a, to bring back the taught portion, whether it's electronic or however it's delivered in, in any event? Because I, I was the first year of the non-taught bar portion where we got two binders and said, you know, read this via Condios, and that was shitty. Yeah. So, <laughs> sorry, are you inquiring whether we would, would you support, advocate yeah, for... What, would you support a, uh, uh, bringing back the taught program? Bringing back the bar ads? Well, yeah. I, I actually think that the LPP and what they're teaching is okay. an enhanced version of the bar ads, if you will. I imagine, and I'd like to hear, that there may be materials that you provide to your students that they're allowed to keep. We. So can, yeah, can I? Yeah. Yeah. So, so two things. First of all, thank you for pointing out the, the you know, the, the photo, and just to clarify, uh, <coughs> with regards to our program. We have each year, and it's it's ridiculously um, uh, um, <laughs> every year we kind of look at the numbers, and it breaks down almost to a T 
Um, you know, we have half of our candidates who come from Canadian law schools, and I think all of our yeah. law schools are, are uh, represented across, country, across yeah. Canada, uh, the, the common law law schools, and then half of our candidates uh, come from our foreign trained lawyers, whether they are immigrants who are ret uh, retraining from their uh, original jurisdiction or if they're Canadians who've gone abroad. And so it's a really nice mix of, of people who need to want to practice law and want to get training. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. It's, uh, it's one of the things that we are quite proud of, uh, in fact, and it just kind of happens organically. Um, in terms of the materials, as I mentioned, so one of our one of our recommendations is that candidates actually have completed the uh, two licensing exams beforehand. However, that is not mandatory. We can't require that. And so what we do find is that some of our candidates will write one or the other of the exams during the program and sometimes maybe leave one or uh, the other or both for the completion of the program. So we have the, the full range from done both of them, start the program, uh, to completing during, to completing afterwards. And in terms of the materials that we provide, what we hear is that the professionalism and ethics component certainly um, is helpful to them with, with that component for those who haven't written. Uh, a number of our candidates will say to us who are writing the barrister or the solicitor exam, you know, um, we don't. We provide resources to get them through the client files, uh, but what they'll say is it contextualizes it. So if I'm studying for my, you know, the uh, the the solicitor exam, doing the real estate file, working on my share purchase agreement in the in the business file, has now kind of made me see what it means when I'm reading what I'm reading for the uh, for the materials. So what we don't have the. 1,200 pages of materials. We have resources, just as if you would think about your office library, but it's an online component. We are expecting most of them to have completed the, li the licensing exams, but we, we realize that it's sort of a, a wide range. Yeah. yeah. John, John Krachenko from Hamilton. I, John? I think that the uh, LPP program <laughs> is uh, a, a wonderful program. They've taken uh, a complicated uh, set of uh, issues and uh, educational pieces and, and formalized them and have rolled them out in a beautiful manner. Having said that, the proposal that, that comes from Ottawa, while, while you were making your presentation, it struck me that it was going back to the old days, like Mike, uh, who articled for 12 years, I, I articled for, <laughs> I, I, I was in the same program. Um, and it struck me that your proposal was very similar, except rather than the Law Society doing the uh, sort of formal training, it was now going through the Ryerson LPP program. And, and I think that if the tendency is to start thinking like that, then that's probably the right answer. I think that the LPP program, you guys have it licked. It's great. I think that you need the two pieces. That's my opinion. I think that uh, uh, the uh, getting people into uh, offices, into the uh, you know in-house or, or wherever is great, but you guys, I think, do an excellent job in providing that training. Uh, I had a similar, uh, I, I had an experience, uh, my, my articling student just went through and got a call uh, and uh, again uh, did the traditional articles. I could not understand why they had to leave their materials behind. Uh, in the old days we had those blue binders, I still have them in my office. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, use them as reference materials, but for some reason they're, they're secret now. When you write your exam, you leave thousands of dollars worth of photocopies and binders behind and walk out. That makes no sense to me. So anyways, to get to my point, I, I would like to see a program where it is a combination of that, sort of along the lines of what Ottawa is saying. But in the meantime, as they're going through it, because all students pay the same thing, and it's a, essentially a system, right? The Law Society has created this system, uh, either LPP or, or the articles, that there should be a sharing of information that you guys have at the LPP uh, at Ryerson has such good resources that I as an articling principal using the traditional form of articles, it would be great for me to be able to, to dip into that well and say, geez, you know, I, I'm deficient in this area. I don't do a lot of criminal work. I'd love to use that module and have it you know, sent to my students so that they can use it because they're all paying the same amount, right? Yeah, I think that's a really excellent. So uh, that that's my only suggestion as far as an enhancement as we move towards some kind of one model for Ontario. Uh, as much as I like the Thunder Bay model, and and uh, I think that 
I think that that was a time when everybody was scrambling to try to figure out solutions and maybe as we go further and further the solution will reveal itself. I, I find it a, a slippery slope to say that one school in Ontario in the province gives a buy to articles if you just happen to be one of the lucky people that are the 80 students in that school and the rest of you are treated a different way. Just from a, you know, it, it just doesn't sit well with me. But hopefully this is the model where we're going to uh, with a formal bit of education that's slick, that's like modern, accessible to everybody, but a, a sharing until we get to that stage. Um, can I just ask, uh, the, the way that it's designed, as I understand it, is you do the, the formal training or teaching and then you do the practicum, the four month placement. And the CCLA's proposal is half of the students would do it that way and half of the students would do the practical training first, or the, the placement first, and then the LPP. And that's not really how it's designed. So is there any concern from Ryerson about the CCLA's proposal and the fact that half of the students would be doing it backwards from how it's actually, how you've designed the system? Uh, and I'll just jump in on that. Uh, we deliberately didn't put that into our presentation, and Mike raised it as well. Uh, Andre and I had uh, a good discussion about that, the order in which the training should happen, and I think Andre made an excellent point. He said, we're finding that uh, students are much more successful in their placements because they've had the four months training in advance. Uh, the reason we proposed it the way that we did, frankly, is we didn't think that Ryerson could actually handle that number of students coming through all together at once. Andre tells me, though, that the program was built, uh, and I didn't actually understand how virtual it was and how people could actually participate uh, from across the province. Um, so I've learned more through speaking with Andre, and he actually thinks it is realistic that the LPP could be rolled out to 2,000 students at once. But then uh, you'd have the placement. And then you'd, you'd have 2,000 students trying to find articling, right? Because the six months, six months was to get extra spaces. Well, exactly. But the other, yeah. the but other option, just also to keep in mind, is that right now, because of our contract, we have a an August start and then a January start. Um, there are different <coughs> parts of the month where things could be shifted. So you can have different intakes uh, to deal with the different timing for both the placement and the training. I will say, though, and, and we're, we're pretty um, uh, confident in saying that that experience on a simulated basis where people can practice, get feedback, get that assessment ahead of time, really for us is critical um, before the placement. Not that it can't be done, but I think the benefit to the candidates uh, and to the employers and to the public is, is such that that order works for us. That's I think right. the other problem with the order as well that Andre and I discussed is the it sets up competition among the students perhaps in a way that's not desirable, right? Oh, well, I want the second month, the second six months instead of the first six months and I'll have a better chance at higher back. So um, these are details, of course, that we'd have to continue talking about, which is why I wanted to um, just take the temperature to see if we all kind of agree that some combo of the LPP, a licensing examination, and articles and or placement and or practicum makes sense. If that's the gold standard we'd like to achieve, then we can start uh, working on those details. What, what order does it get rolled out? Um, and if the whole province uh, can say to the Law Society, these are the three components that we feel strongly the licensing process should include, uh, since we are the deliverers of uh, much of the education, I think our voice should be heard on that. And, and one of the pieces uh, around the placement component is that we are restricted to the January to April window at the moment. We have employers who are willing to offer placements over the course of the summer and in the fall. We have employers who are willing to offer placements at different points along the way. So by opening up the year to now offering placements at different times, you're in a position to be able to offer more placements and more opportunity, um, so long as the folks have had the, fun, the foundational training first with the training component. Can I also, uh, on the placement, just a confirmation that um, we don't just sort of send out our candidates into the placements and leave the employers and the placement and the uh, candidates sort of on their own for those four months and hands off. They are part of our program, and so we reach out to the employer, we reach out to the candidate, um, at least a couple of times during their placement because we need to confirm that they have met the expectations. And so there's that engagement back and forth with the employer so we understand that they are, the candidate's receiving the training that they're hoping to get and that the candidate's meeting the expectations. So it's, it, you know, it's that engagement. We're supporting everyone throughout the course of the placement, 
trying to ensure that everything goes smoothly as Gina is describing. In addition to that as well, sometimes the employer may have questions uh, or the candidate. Uh, they may want, even want to get some assistance and we're there to help support them through that. And that's <laughs> what we encourage as part of it. Um, the other piece of the placement segment as well is to just be mindful that um, not every employer, as uh, Jill mentioned a moment ago, will double up, but they can offer what makes sense for them. And that flexibility is going to be key to ensuring employers want to participate and will sign up for, uh, with us. So we've got about 10 minutes left, so we'll take comment. But if you do have comments, make sure you get your hands up so we can get a microphone to yeah, you and hear I, from you. I just have a quick comment with my friend that if you were, I had a bad experience with someone who was called and was completely incompetent. His articles taught him nothing about the practice of law. So that it's, um, I think that there needs to be, whoever is supervising in the placement, and clearly through Ryerson you've got a program, there should be some standard set and supervision of the supervisors. So that if you have a student, you must meet certain standards in terms of what you are teaching and showing that person. And they should be, there should be someone measuring that. So we don't have people who've done their articles and they know nothing about the practice of law because they've been used as a, as a rather overqualified office um, <laughs> tea lady or whatever. So they, they really haven't learned anything about what they need to know. And I think that that's an important, really important that those materials and standards be in place so that you know that every person who's been through their articles have met a certain um, exposure at a certain standard. That's be great. Yeah. <laughs> And just, I just want to confirm that with the training component, remember that we do have some feedback and training for the mentors as well. Uh, and there is that consistency for those four months so that when you go off to training, you might, to the pro, uh, placement, you might only do real estate or you might only do family, but you've had that exposure across the board with the with two different mentors uh, in the earlier part. And so that's one of the reasons why when you think about the breakdown, the, the competencies are something that we are delivering for eight months, not just four months or not, not just one set of four months. Uh, the substantive is something that, you know, that's where the licensing exams or other uh, has to come in. Yeah. And just comment at the back. Quickly on the placement side of it as well. The candidates apply to the positions that are posted. So you as employers get to post what you're looking for in your candidate, the area of law that you're involved with, and all the types of things. And then the candidates get the option of applying to the various roles that are up there that interest them. So that when you then get a list of the candidates who apply to your role, you then choose who you interview and who you want to bring on board for the placement. So that way it's a much more open system for the employer and for the candidate to be able to hopefully land in something that each other is interested in. I just wanted to... Uh get some clarification regarding, uh, I think it was said earlier today that uh, there's no way to limit the amount of uh, people that are licensed. And uh, I just want to, maybe I'm just missing something, but why is that? And, and it seems to me that if the law schools aren't getting on board, for lack of a better term, in, regarding the training that we've all been speaking about um, in the practical training as well, I mean, if, if, the, if there's a limited amount of licensees or potential people that can become lawyers, then that affects the law schools. So uh, it seems to me that it's kind of the wrong side is running the equation or, or running, running the show here, is that the law schools are sit, sitting back and saying, well, we don't think that's important. We just teach them how to think like lawyers, and that's all we have to do. And that's besides the fact that most law schools, at least as far as I know, don't really have any type of business training of teaching people how to, at least just the basics of how to run a law firm, even though obviously everyone doesn't want to be a lawyer or run a law firm or be uh, in business as a lawyer, be a government lawyer, et cetera. Um, I, just, I just wanted to know, what, I mean, I, my understanding is that medical uh, associations or medical licensing boards, they limit the amount of doctors. Maybe that, maybe I'm mistaken on that too, but it seems like if people are saying there's too many lawyers, and some people are saying that, maybe not everybody, and maybe they're not trained as well, it just seems that the law society, who is the one that's giving out the ticket to be able to practice law, why can't they impose their will? The position of the law society, and it I think it's a valid one, is that uh, we are a self-regulated profession. 
But if we get into the business of limiting the number of licensees, then we are going to run right into the head of the Office of the Integrity Commissioner, and we are going to be in danger of losing that self-regulation. Restricting numbers in a profession creates monopoly, and they don't want us to do that. With other professions, they're regulated by the government, and so they have more flexibility to have that kind of control, because the government can do that for itself, but we're not the government. And uh, that, that is the major concern, and so the Law Society is certainly absolutely not interested in limiting the numbers. That's not on the table. What we can do is raise the standards. So if we do have a flood of applicants, the, the way to make sure the numbers are lower on the other side is make it harder to get through the whole process. But there's still issues with that, too, as well. So that's, that's why the numbers isn't part of the discussion at this point. Hi, Chris Russell from uh, Peterborough. Uh, I really like the CCLA idea. I, I had the initial concern about the ordering. I thought you should do the experiential learning before you do the placement. Yeah. Um, and I also think that it would be, the only thing that I would want to add in there is something to do with um, the, the licensing exam and maybe some education around that. And it would make sense to me to put that in the middle there. You do the experiential learning, you have some coursework to tie it into the exams, you take the exams, You've already written your exams, you've done your experiential learning, you've passed, and now you do your placement and you're ready to, and then you're probably more attractive to the um, firm or wherever you are that you're placed because you've done the exams, they know you've passed, they know that you've taken the coursework. And so that was my only comment. It'd be nice to add in an additional component perhaps of helping people to get through their exams with some actual education around the yeah, and then maybe your virtual law firm turns into your virtual study group for your bar exams. Mm -hmm. Because one of the differences between people go through the NCA versus go to Canadian law schools is we all had the benefit of all the people that came before us and they passed down their indexes and we would then get into groups and annotate them and people coming through the other process didn't have the advantage of that camaraderie and built in um, people to help you get through the exam. Whereas if you did that in the order you just said, it's a natural fit. Those four people already work together. They know each other. They can help each other through the exams as well. Um, I just wanted to, because we're coming to the end of the session, and <coughs> Jill, you and I haven't talked about this, but I'm thinking as a next step uh, that those three components that we're talking about, and you've certainly got the temperature of this room, but I'm not sure if everyone here has consulted with their members to be able to really make sure that that's what their members feel too. So I'm thinking, though, that we could send out something that just basically is asking if, if you could consult with your members to ensure that your members are comfortable with us saying that as a province that full, you know, full of position on this is that these three components are essential to the licensing process and then move that matter forward. Is that what you were hoping? Yeah, I, I think that sounds great and we might even be able to add in the order. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there might be agreement on that as well. Yeah, um, so um, part of our post plenary material then will, that we are sending out to you will include a uh, request that you take back to your members and uh, get some feedback from us and we'll maybe put a, a soft timeline just to make sure people don't, it doesn't fall off your radar maybe by the end of the year or something so that we can then go back to the Law Society and, and explain what we've been talking about and what, uh, what our members feel. Is that fair? Yeah. Thank right. you very, very much okay. to everybody. And uh, I'm happy for people to contact me directly. And I don't know if people know, since Mike Raz has been working on revamping the website, we do have a, um, a dialogue on licensing thread through our Facebook page if people want to do that. I don't know. Apparently, that's what the young people do. <laughs> <laughs> it's and not a thing for me. it's easier to find me, those materials on your website than it is on the Law Society's. So this is if true. you're looking for the Law Society's materials, go to FOLA's. We'll uh, <laughs> include a link to their materials on our website. <laughs>